We uh, returned yesterday from a, a week away at camp. We went to Camp Manitani. Um, our kids were campers for the week. Natalie and I were volunteers along with a host of other volunteers. Uh, we had, I think, about 100 campers, uh, overnight campers, and then uh, 30 or 40 some day campers that, that came in uh, in addition to the other campers. So it was a lot of work. We are tired. Um, I just took headache medicine this morning because of just lack of sleep and uh, running nonstop for, for seven or eight days straight. Um, but one of the cool things about camp is uh, camp really is, is not just about getting kids together and you know, having a good time, uh, but it's about equipping them. It's about equipping them as the best that we can because we get these kids for one week. Um, one week out of the whole year, out of 52, we get them for one week. So that week really matters. And it's really challenging. Those of you who've done camp before know that it's really challenging to train and equip children and adults. <laughs> it's really challenging. So to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, that is our theme for this year. And this is not some magical formula. This is not something that we preach through. And, you know, at the end of the year, we're going to be like, all right, we're all equipped and ready to go. It takes dedication and hard work. It's hard work. So when we were at camp this week, there were, um, there were three points that uh, Jonathan Woodall, who's a good friend of ours, um, he was the camp director for the week. He had three truths for the week. Um, I'm going to start out today with three truths. Now, before anybody gets too upset, these are obviously um, not true. They're kind of satirical uh, to prove a point. But one, God is mediocre. Two, we will give God the bare minimum of our time, of our money, of our service. And number three, we will honor God by creating as many obstacle courses as possible for our children to get to Jesus. Now, clearly, is that statement, are those statements true? I hope you guys are saying no. Another question, do our practices reflect these statements? It's one thing to say that a statement's not true. It's another to say, do our practices reflect those kinds of statements? Today, we're going to talk about Jesus becoming indignant. The word indignant uh, means feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. It, that word is used only one, or sorry, seven times in all of the Bible. Seven times in all of the Bible, only once in reference to Jesus. Only one time did Jesus become indignant, and that was the passage that was just read for us. Um, the, the instances, some of these are repeated, so it's not seven instances. Uh, it's just seven times that that word indignant shows up in Scripture. Um, I'll, I'll walk through these and just tell you what they are. We're not going to read them all. But one of them, Jesus healed a woman who was bent over for 18 years. He happened to heal on the Sabbath, and a synagogue ruler, the scriptures tell us, became indignant. Uh, the word is a combination of two different words in the original language. It means excessive grief. You're grieved excessively by what you're seeing to the point where it becomes uh, bothersome to you. You become indignant. You become upset to where you have to say something. The synagogue ruler got upset that a woman was healed on the wrong day of the week. What do we become indignant about as Christians? Uh, the second story, a woman anointed Jesus while he was eating with very expensive oil. She took this alabaster jar of oil, she broke it open, and she poured it over top of Jesus' head while he was eating. Jesus' disciples became indignant, and they scolded her. They yelled at her, literally. Their reason? Not that they were anointing the Savior of mankind, the Son of God, but they became indignant because they said, you could have used that oil for something else. You could have taken the money from that oil, and you could have helped poor people. 
They became so bothered by it. It bothered them internally. That's what this word indignant means, that we get upset about something to the point where we have to speak out about it. Their focus was not on Jesus Christ, the Savior, and what this woman was doing to anoint him. But they were wrapped up in hypotheticals. Do we ever do that as Christians? We all do it. Well, you could have done this better. You should have done this. Why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you do it that way? And we become indignant to the point where we scold our fellow brothers and sisters because of hypotheticals for things that they should have done. And this was her own oil. It was her own money. It was her own business for what she did with that money. The third instance, James and John, uh, James and John ask which one of them will sit at Jesus' right hand. And the other ten became indignant. I don't think they became indignant because they were like, what are you guys talking about? Who sits at the right hand? You know, I think they became indignant because they were like, well, we want in on this. Why should those two get to sit at the right hand or the left hand of Jesus? Why, why wouldn't we get to do that? And they became indignant. The fourth instance is this one that was read for us this morning. Now listen where the focus is when people become indignant. This is Jesus becoming indignant to the point where he had to say something. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, his disciples, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. The fifth and final instance also involved children and somebody becoming indignant. It comes from Matthew 21, 14 through 17. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant. Children praising God is what made them indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Beth Bethany and lodged there. Do, do you hear the difference between Jesus's becoming indignant versus everybody else. Everybody else is getting indignant because something bothers their own personal feelings and agenda. Jesus brings it back to the children and he sees people hindering children from coming to him and he becomes upset about it. He becomes angry. He becomes indignant. He becomes bothered by that. There's this great grief inside of him to where he becomes angry and he speaks out. We were at camp this week, and there was so much good that happened. This was um, part of the group. So I just snapped this picture during um, one of the activity times. There was a host of children here, bunches and bunches and bunches of children, um, incredible campers. Kids, by the way, are so smart. They're so smart. We give them so little credit. These kids are sharp. But we're at camp. Uh, we had, like I said, about, um, about 100 campers uh, plus the 30 or 40 some day campers. Um, and they were amazing. These kids were fun. Um, I, I was a Bible teacher, so I got to teach literally every single camper. So they, they cycled them through in cohorts. They had groups. And uh, there were several of us Bible teachers, and we each were responsible for our own lessons. And I got to teach all the kids, and I thought um, there were a couple, couple things that came to mind. On day number one, uh, we showed up on Sunday, and we had worship. Or no, we showed up on Saturday. See, my days all blend together. We showed up on Saturday. We worshiped Sunday morning. And as we're worshiping, uh, we got to communion 
and I saw sheer <coughs> panic and confusion on the faces of both the kids and the staff when the communion came around to the kids. They didn't know what to do. Do we take it? Do we not take it? And the kids were having this internal struggle. I'm going to need my water. <coughs> my allergies were really bad. And I'm grateful to be back in Somerset because out there, my allergies were kicked up. But there was this internal struggle, and Natalie and I were talking, and we talked to um, the directors about it because they, they saw it too. And Jonathan stepped in, and he got up, and he made an announcement about it. Um, and I'm not coming up with a theological position right now. That's not what I'm saying. But what stuck out to me is that we have done a poor job about instructing our kids and adults, for that matter, about communion. We do it every single week, and I think there are certain things that we take for granted that we're not instructing our kids. Uh, we're not teaching our kids, and we're certainly not asking our kids to participate. And so that will be corrected. As we uh, talk about, and we've talked about this here on, on I think, a Wednesday night, uh, we've talked about this, that there's this cloud of confusion because we've not equipped people even to worship, at least very well. Um, so I will have some sermons on communion just that shed light. I'm not going to tell people what to do one way or the other. We're just going to look at the scriptures, and we're going to help equip. We're going to talk to people. Uh, the other thing is that when, um, when the kids were coming through my group, uh, one of our lessons was Jeremiah, and we nicknamed them Jer Jer. So um, if you ever hear my kids refer to Jeremiah the prophet as Jer Jer, um, that's because the kids came up with that nickname for Jeremiah the prophet. Um, but as we were going through Jer Jer, um, one of the excuses that Jeremiah gave for not preaching is, I'm too young. I don't have the right words to say. And God comes back to Jer Jer and says, don't say that you're too young. I'm going to put the words into your mouth. Your age doesn't matter. You are called to preach. And so as the, as the campers were coming around um, in my group, I wanted to kind of survey as we were going through that lesson. And I asked kids, these questions. I said, how many of you have ever been asked by adults what you wanted to be when you grow up? Almost 100% of the campers, I'd say 95 plus percent of the campers all raise their hands. I've been asked by an adult at some point, what do I want to be when I grow up? Then I asked, how many of you were asked what you want to be right now by an adult? I had one, one camper out of all of them had ever been asked, what do you want to be right now? So we're going to play a little bit of Family Feud, um, and we're going to hear some of the results that I heard from the kids. Uh, these were in their own, own mouths. I didn't put words into their mouth. I didn't ask leading questions. I just asked them a couple basic questions just to kind of gauge where our kids are and how they feel about faith and how they feel about serving and how they feel about um, being connected to God. So I asked them this question, what are things that adults tell you you cannot do because you're too young? Kind of a broad question, but that was my question. What are things that adults say you cannot do because you're too young? By the way, anybody want to throw any, question, any answers out for what you think might be some of the ones? What's that? All right. Survey says drinking. Driving. What else? Making your own decisions. Any others? All right. Those are, those are good answers. So the survey says, number one, top of the list, drive a car. People say, I cannot drive a car. Those pesky adults <laughs> telling kids they can't drive a car. The second most common answer, serving during worship. I thought that was interesting because kids didn't just tell me this, they lamented this. 
Remember what Jesus became indignant about? Do not hinder these little ones from coming to me. He's not talking about just coming to him, and he's not just putting, him, putting kids in his lap and saying, all right, now, now, you know, job done. Jesus is talking about equipping. He's talking about serving. He's talking about do not stop these children from coming to me. Number two, things adults tell these kids that they can't do, serve during worship. Number three, most common answer, serve outside of church services. In other words, to serve in any capacity to help other people, you're too young. Guys, if this doesn't make us indignant, we better reevaluate. Number four, any kind of work or manual labor. Um, these kids want to work. Are you hearing a common theme among these kids? We said it's kind of interesting. We had this conversation with some of the other Bible teachers. We said there was kind of a Generation X where, um, you know, like I'm at the tail end of this generation where you're just brought up, you do things because somebody tells you to do it, right? Like high expectations. You show up to worship because it's the right thing to do. Um, Natalie and I talk about how we have this internal conflict. If we ever have to miss, miss a worship service for any reason, whether it's vacation, traveling, whatever, we physically have an internal struggle. It bothers us to our core. Uh, we were brought up in that generation. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Don't make excuses. You just do it. The millennials say, we get that, we understand but we want to know why we're expected to go to worship. They want a why attached to it. What are we there for? What's our purpose? Because anybody can show up. We want to know what we're here for. But now we have this younger generation that's my kid's age, and they want answers. And these kids are not going to take Bible verses thrown at them to say, well, here's what the scripture says. They want to know. Logically, why can't we do, or why do we do the things that we do? Why do we do the things we do? Why don't we do certain things? They want to know a logical reason combined with Scripture, and they are chomping at the bits to serve. I think that's fantastic. I think that is a bright future for the church. I think when we're equipping people, we ought to put a lot of eggs in the basket of these kids and help and equip them. They are raring to go. And then finally, the last answer, um, things adults say you can't do because you're too young, buy tobacco and alcohol. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> so then we talked about this, right? Some of these are, are, are legal things for a very good reason. And others are just positions that we take because those are our positions. And we don't really have a good logical explanation and so we talked about this a little bit. Did God call young people to serve? Absolutely. He did it often. Timothy was very young when Paul took him out on the trail. Some, if not the majority of scholars, believe that Timothy was somewhere between the ages of 12 and 14 when he was circumcised and went out preaching with Paul on the missionary journeys. Um, Jeremiah, we don't know how young he was, but it's quite likely, quite plausible that he was a teenager. Um, maybe mid-teens, upper teens, Jeremiah said, I don't want to pray. I'm too young. I don't have the words to say. And God said, don't say that. See, God becomes indignant when we try to stop or hinder kids from serving him. We serve an amazing God. God is anything but mediocre. God is all-powerful. We won't give God the bare minimum. We will give God everything that we have inside of our soul, inside of our body. We will give God our all. We'll give God our time. We'll give God our money. We will give God our service. And that includes helping our children to serve. And we will honor God by removing as many obstacles as possible for our children to get to Jesus. I want to be that church. I want to be that congregation that says, we believe in our kids. We believe in helping equip them to serve. We shouldn't say, what, what, do you, what do you want to serve? In what capacity do you want to serve when you grow up? Because we're having a lot of people 
who were once little people who were growing up and they've heard no so many times that they get to a point where they're so conditioned to hear that you can't serve that they won't serve anymore. <clears throat> Jesus became indignant when people hindered the children from coming to him. <clears throat> the message is yours. Um, I'm encouraged. I walk away from camp super encouraged. We had um, praise and worship. By the way, our singing from these little people, Eden's age and younger, was phenomenal. I mean, I had chills running up my body. The singing was absolutely phenomenal. It, 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 these people filled that place with their voices and with the Holy Spirit. The singing was absolutely fantastic. These kids can sing, which is really cool. Uh, we had four, were there four or five that were baptized this past week? Five? Um, five were baptized into Christ. They put Christ on a baptism at the camp. Um, the kids were 100% giving of their time, their effort, and their worship. Uh, they took us seriously. And in the Bible classes, I had, again, I had all of the campers, and these kids are sharp. Some of these kids know their Bible, and the ones that didn't worked really hard to know their Bible. They really, really took us seriously. I walked away super encouraged. Um, I think our kids are absolutely the future. That's not just a cliche. I think that um, our kids are the future, but the future starts now. We've got to equip our children to serve. They can and they should do it. The message is yours. Uh, let's help equip these little people. They're amazing. Let's help equip them. Let's work together as a congregation and help equip them. If there's anybody this morning who has prayer needs, or if you've not yet taken that step to put Christ on in baptism, I would ask you to come up. We're all going to stand, and we're going to sing this song together as a church. Let's sing. <clears throat>